Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 10th episode of the Gabriel Asylum Foundation's live series, Consulting Without Borders Perspectives, in which we feature prominent international consultants and experts working to address global challenges, promote professional excellence, and build a sustainable future. Today is December 1st. I hope you're all doing well wherever you are on the globe. Please let us know where you're tuning in from. My name is Victoria Olska, and I'm broadcasting today from Florida, United States. I'm the president of Gabriel El Salim Foundation, a US-based nonprofit organization working internationally. Uh, the foundation is dedicated to the remarkable life of Gabriel Al Salim and has the mission to facilitate a forum for sustainable discourse, connect and recognize leaders who are making a difference on a global scale and force them in an environment for the open-minded, creative, multilingual and cross-cultural global problem solving. Today, we are live on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and even Twitter. You can uh, put your questions or comments for, for us and our speaker directly in the comment section of the social media that, you're, that you are tuning in from. Uh, whichever platform you are on, please hit the like button. This way, more people can see and join our live stream. I'm being helped today by Anya Al Salim, who is working behind the scenes from Utrecht, Netherlands, uh, to ensure everything runs smoothly. Today, we will be talking about responsible business, what it means and what the challenges are of transforming businesses and what initiatives exist that are uh, seeking to change the way business does business. And uh, our guest speaker, who will be addressing this topic, will be joining us today from Ontario, Canada. He is an activist at Responsible Business 2030. He is also a director at a company called Vision. He is a thinker, he is the author, he is a futurist. He is a, a fellow certified management consultant and actually served as one of the Canada's trustees at the International Council of Management Consulting Institutes, ICMCI. He has been involved in the Canada CMC organization as well as uh, made a huge contribution to developing institutes in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and also the Caribbean Institute of Management Consultants. He's had his own consulting and uh, personal professional a development business for many years and he, he has gradually evolved to focus on the human dimension of business. Now he is officially retired after a career spanning over 50 years but continues to be actively involved in the responsible business movement. I would like to welcome Nick Shepherd, who is joining us as I said from Ontario, Canada. Welcome Nick. Hello. Thanks, Vika. <laughs> Hi, Nick. There was a bit of a de delay there, so I yes, wasn't sure. Yes, um, very unfortunately, we've been experiencing delays on our, you know, live streaming platform, and it, it's on every country that we're joining from. I, I'm not sure what is causing this, but I hope that uh we we broadcast uh well the broadcast doesn't get interrupted that the video is on and especially the sound so please please you know let us know if you can hear us well and i hope the uh, this technical glitch won't become an issue while we are doing our discussion so anyway you know, th thank you nick for joining us welcome and i was as i was giving the introduction and uh, going over all these wonderful things that you've been doing in your life. I also, uh, at this point, I wanted to say that, well, Nick uh, is a, a longtime friend and colleague, and he was actually a colleague of Gabriel as well uh, in around uh, two th uh, 2007, 2008, 
Nick was in, in Kazakhstan working on creating a consulting organization there, working directly with Gabriel, while Gabriel was with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And then later on, uh, after the tragedy happened and we lost Gabriel in 2010, Nick was also supporting the foundation. He was one of the judges on the award committee. Uh, we've been running the, the National Award for Excellence in Consulting, and Nick was one of the judges for quite some time. So I'm very happy to, to see you. Thank you again for joining. I see it. Gulsum Ahtamberdiyeva from Kazakhstan, also our, our dear colleague and friend, saying that she's very happy to see you as well. well it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I have so many happy memories of those, uh, those days in Kazakhstan, and of course it, uh, it, it developed into uh, some work in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, and then of course we all came together in uh, um jordan when we uh, we put the first candidates through as certified management consultants and so i i have great memories of those trailblazers uh, especially in kazakhstan um certainly we don't need to go into it but the 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 people who were involved will remember there were a few bumps along the road as we were trying to get the uh, the kazakhstan institute established and i have to congratulate those who are now running it that you've done a phenomenal job picking it up and and getting it going so uh well done it's great it's wonderful to be back here and be uh, be part of uh be part of this this activity and i've got to congratulate you vicar i think uh, the work that you've been doing over the last many years is uh is again trailblazing and you've done some really really good things and i think it's wonderful to try and bring people together that was one of the uh the kind of lessons I learned when I was in Kazakhstan, I have to admit, I was, um, I had some trepidation. I've never worked in Eastern Europe at all. And I think as a, as a inverted commas, Westerner, um, you know, we, we get to sort of all our impressions of what happens in life in, uh, in other parts of the world, sometimes through the media. So as I say, when I went to Kazakhstan, I had some trepidation. Um, and I, I realized in that, experience particularly how we all have the same passions to a degree in life we want to be recognized we want to do good work we want to uh, to live our lives we want to have opportunity we want to be rewarded we want to be recognized we want to be stimulated to give the best that we can give and it really reinforced that that work that i'd already started to do in the area of people in business um, you know, many people recognize that I my background is actually in finance, which is probably weird. You know, I remember when I first went into consulting, I started doing a lot of work in customer service because that was my passion at the time. I had uh, I'd been president of a distribution company for a few years, and uh, I really didn't know the the business that well. So I had said to the owner, uh, I wanted to go out and spend. Uh, 40% uh, of my time, two days a week, actually out at our branches that were serving our customers. I wanted to talk to staff. I wanted to talk to customers and really get to understand the business. And um, as I did that, I, you know, I got away from the typical sitting behind the desk in the office, especially as my career, as they say, been in finance until I became president. And I realized how often we lose touch with customers and people in the marketplace. So I, when I left that role and set up my own consulting business, I wanted to go into customer service because I felt it was such a critical issue um, to, to organizational success. And it was kind of funny because I used to go into clients where there was an opportunity to do some consulting work. And I would tell them all about my passion for customer service and how critical it was. And they would sort of look at me quizzically and say, uh, yeah, but your background is in accounting, isn't it? Isn't it in finance? And there was sort of a, a dichotomy here that, that how could somebody who's got a background in finance possibly understand or even recognize or even accept that, you know, people are important in business. People are just numbers to accountants. People are just, you know, everybody's worried about the cost of the people. Uh, and yet the, the passion 
is for moving beyond the cost and thinking of the value of people in an organization. So as you said, Vika, early, early introduction, but how did I get into this? Because of that very reason, because I have a passion for, for recognizing that whilst people are the greatest cost for most businesses and they spend you know, a lot of money on, uh, on paying people and paying suppliers, which in a lot of ways is people. Um, and, you know, so much of our resources go into to people, to human resources. And yet we, we focus so much on the cost of those people and not on the potential, not on creating a work environment where those people can really give their best. And the difference between giving your best and just an average employee is, is an organization's competitive advantage. So there we are. I mean, that's that's how I got into the business. And then, of course, as you know, I uh, I ended up putting a lot of my uh, ideas into books and things and uh, talking a lot about that. Right. And as I was uh, preparing for this broadcast, well, I, of course, looked at the books that you that you wrote over, uh, I guess, uh, a few years, because there's a lot of books. <laughs> and I was reading some of the articles that I found. And yeah, that uh, it says that uh, the former uh, CFO, uh, who spent almost his entire career in finance, uh, started publishing books, <laughs> uh, speaking about the more like the uh the you know human side of the business right and the issues that businesses face uh and uh it's just it's just quite remarkable and as, as i was going through some of the titles and the descriptions of your books uh you've been so prolific <laughs> how how long i mean when did you did you write uh, your first book i i started actually when i was still in accounting i was doing a lot of uh articles for accounting magazines and things and uh, my first actual book and it was an interesting time because word processors had just come into the technology that we had that that we were actually and i know this really dates me but um if you wanted to write a book in those days you either wrote it in longhand and had somebody type it up on a typewriter for you or i was lucky enough that that i wrote my book sort of longhand but then um, we had these wonderful things called word processors, which were sort of the early stages of, uh, you know, before Word uh, and things like that came into to the vogue. And it was about something called variance analysis. It was about understanding costs and being able to break costs down to causal factors. You know, if we're not producing the profit we want to produce, why, why is that happening? What do we need to go and fix? So that was my first book, and that was in 19, I think that was 1980 that I published that oh, first book. okay, so that was quite a while ago. <laughs> I thought that you wrote all those books in just uh, in the last couple of years, and I thought, oh, that's a lot. Well, as we are talking about Nick's books, I actually uh, put together a slide where I put some of the titles on, and I will ask Anya yeah, to, to bring it on the screen. This is just uh, the ones that Nick, uh, you know, that you sent me uh, to look at, and you can see that they do address the issues of uh, uh, the the corporate culture, the company's culture, and the leadership, uh, governance, accountability, sustainable development. So all sorts of uh, very important issues. And uh, I also wanted to actually welcome a couple more people who posted. Uh, Ron Finch is here with us, and I'm not sure anymore where he is. Uh, joining us from but uh he because he travels quite a bit <laughs> i thought the last time he was in morocco but uh, i saw him i saw him saying hi and also we we had a question from tim son uh, a dear friend who actually taught me to do a live broadcasting thank you for joining us tim and tim had a question uh, early mm. on Maybe Anya can bring it back uh, on the screen, asking what inspired you to to write the books. Yeah, I, I saw your question, Tim. It's a yeah. really good question, um, and and I have to be honest. I mean, what inspired me over the last three years, of course, was COVID. I had a had an awful lot of time on my hands, especially being sort of semi-retired and uh, and not really being able to go anywhere or do anything. But I think one of the things that inspires you to write a book 
is is sort of the passion for getting a message out there. You know, one of the real advantages you tend to have as you get older, you you add to your base of experience. And one of the things that that I've sort of learned over the years is when you look at business, business is, is a system. What, a, what an effective business is, is an organization that brings together all sorts of different resources with the goal of producing some particular output. And essentially, effective management of a business is the effectiveness with which we, you bring all of those resources together. And so because of my consulting experience, because of my management experience, one of the things I, I realized, although my, my functional focus was finance, I realized that finance is one of the resources. Sure, it's a very critical resource. And finance is certainly one of the key outcomes in terms of profitability and value to the shareholder. But if you look internally in the organizations, then it's the effectiveness with which you, you look at all those resources and bring them together. And it's kind of interesting. You'll see there's a book there, Governance, Accountability, and Sustainable Development. I wrote that in uh, around 2005, which means that I probably started working on the idea in the late 1990s. I was getting really frustrated that the world was changing and we were having all sorts of scandals and problems and issues. Um, I remember one particular headline from the papers after there'd been one particular, I forget who it was, but uh, it was. It might have been around even Watergate, which I think was um, the, the the savings and loan scandal in the uh, in the late eighties, early nineties, if I remember. And one of the headlines was "Are directors asleep at the wheel?" In other words, directors are responsible for corporate governance. How can this stuff be happening? Why why don't people on the boards of directors know what's going on in their organization? And that's why I wrote the book, Governance Accountability and Sustainable Development, because I said our governance structures aren't any longer built for the type of organizations we run today. Organizations we run today are very much focused around intellectual capital. Uh, it's the knowledge economy, and we, you, we need different guidances. And I saw that management was already doing this. Management had already adopted things like the balance scorecard and the corporate dashboard and things like that. So I was saying, why aren't we using some of these tools that management has adopted for reporting to the boards of directors and reporting to the public on the effective integration of all of those resources which are necessary to run a business in the 21st century? And I have to add, and you know, it's a, a Forgive me, I don't want to be arrogant, but this book came out in 2005. The uh, Institute for the International Institute for um, Sustain, uh, not Sustainable, but IIRC, International Institute for, um, oh, good Lord, my mind is going. It must be too early in the morning here. Anyway, in, in the early 2000s, it came out in 2013, actually, the framework for integrated reporting. Many of the ideas for the framework for integrated reporting, which now forms our foundation for ESG um, reporting, comes out of the ideas that were in this book. You know, and it was obvious to me years before that institute actually got off the ground that we needed to change things. And so, uh, I, long answer to your question, Tim, but it's really a passion. And I should add one other thing while we're looking at the books. Uh, some of you will notice, yeah, there's 10 books there. But if you look at the bottom row, there's two books. One is called No Fun at Great Toys. And the other one is called Fun Returns to Great Toys. One of the things I learned as I was writing books is that, you know, textbooks and business books can be kind of dry. And I had read a book um, in my financial career called The Goal by Eli Goldratt. He's uh, deceased now, God bless him. But Eli was a, an Israeli physicist who had uh, become a global expert in the concept of the theory of constraints. But he had also applied that concept, that sort of that engineering concept, to running a business. And he'd written a book called The Goal, G O A L, The Goal, uh, which had become sort of standard reading for anybody in the uh, finance area and in general management, in fact, as to how you look at the business as a system. And he'd written it on the basis of a novel. 
I mean, it was a business book, but it was written around the concept of a novel. And I thought, well, gee, I think this whole thing about corporate culture and corporate responsibility is can be told, the story can be told in a similar way. So No Fun at Great Toys is actually a novel about the CEO, Steve, who comes back to run his family business and discovers that his family business has basically been run into the ground because they've been focusing on financial performance and they've essentially depleted all of the innovation and creativity in the business. And if he wants to save the business, he has to actually start rebuilding it. And so no fun at Great Toys maps the journey really that Steve has in finding out what's the real problem, what's the root cause of the problem. And of course, book number two is his implementation of all of those activities. Fun Returns to Great Toys is how he actually turns things around. He gets a group of people involved in the company in telling him what it is that needs to be changed. They develop a a foundation for a corporate culture. They get people involved and engaged in process. They rebuild their relationships with their suppliers. They rebuild their relationships with their customers. And they also, most importantly, rebuild their relationship with the community within which they operate, which is, of course, part of social responsibility. So there's there's a combination of books there. You know, there's there's a lot of them are written out of the passion of we need to focus on certain things in running our businesses. But the other two, the the no fun at great, the two great toys books, are really trying to take the idea of writing a story that involves people and personalities, and how do they come together to actually make this change in a business. So awfully long answer to your question, but it is a good segue, I think, into our discussion on responsible business, because responsible business is, in my my way of thinking, the outcome of many of these things. I mean, one of the first questions I asked and I said I would talk about is what evidence do we have that change is needed? Well, I, I, I think some of you might, might look at the behavior of business over the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, I mean, business has never been perfect because business is like the rest of us. It operates in a society that's not perfect. But there are areas of what I would call social responsibility. I mean, we, we all know individually how to behave in society, I think. You know, there, we know there are certain things laid down in law that we have to abide by. But there are also expectations of behavior that we have to abide by in society. You know, we know it's not necessarily um, the law that you can or can't do certain things, but there are certain expectations of behavior as being a a citizen of society. And I think people would look at the way business has been operating um, in, in recent years and would say there's an opportunity for improvement. I mean, there's a lot of visibility in the area of um, climate change, obviously, because the things called externalities, business has been operating with no um, cost to business of polluting the atmosphere, um, polluting uh, the environment in terms of, of dumping of waste, uh, disposing of waste, um, not worrying about the consequences of, 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 let's call it abuse of the physical environment, of water, of forests, of the ecosystem. And there is a growing awareness, obviously, through climate change that business may not pay for these things, but business is affecting the rest of us in society by the way that it's it, it's been doing these things. And business needs to be called to account for those externalities. So the whole focus around climate change, I think, tells us that business needs to change the way it operates. But I would go further than that. I would say there is evidence, for example, that business not only does act unethically in some cases, and I'll come back to that a little bit, but for example, there's um, there's a an, an organization uh, in, in the US, and they're also running in the UK now, that's called Violation Tracker. And it's part of a group out of Washington that's called uh, Good Jobs. And part of their, 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 their services they offer is something called Violation Tracker. And for the last 20 years, they've been tracking all of the legal cases that are being brought by regulatory agencies 
uh, in the US. And now, as I say, they've started in the UK doing the same thing. And it's astounding. I mean, I, I um, the individual who runs the company was kind enough, uh, Philip Matera, I believe his name is, um, was kind enough when I was writing one of the books on the, in fact, the cost of poor culture. Um, I used some of their data to identify the cost of not running um, a business with a good culture. Because what happens is you get financial surprises. You find out that the organization has broken the law. You find out that you're being called to account and you have to go to court. You have to pay the regulator. And I had thought, well, this is good, interesting information. He sent me a spreadsheet with all of their data on it. And I was astounded that there were 480,000 lines of data on that spreadsheet, 480,000 specific instances where organizations in the US, now this is just the USA, uh, had committed and, and not only committed, but had been proven uh, to have broken the law. And it's frightening to ask yourself the question, has, has breaking the law now just become a cost of doing business? Are organizations just pushing the boundaries to the degree that says, well, let's see if we can get away with it. And I mean, we're talking uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, I think the number is close to six or seven hundred billion dollars um, of fines and penalties that have been exerted uh, on these organizations. Now, in some cases, they were out of court settlements where the organization admitted no crime but paid the fine. And I, I think one has to at least, you know, say, well, maybe you can give them the benefit of the doubt, but they broke the law. Um, so. And in the UK, it's the same sort of thing. I think if I remember the numbers, the top group of organizations in the UK is the financial services uh, um, group, which, of course, includes the banks, investment companies, insurance companies, uh, financial advisors, people like this. And of course, we've seen this recently with the, the, the unregulated portion of the financial services industry with the cryptocurrency. Um, and, and it's just another example of the, the dangers of a lack of adequate re regulation. Um, but in the UK, I think their number, if I remember rightly, was something in the region of 127, um, we're talking million, yes, 100, 127 million pounds in fines and penalties in that segment alone. And I have to pay credit to an organization in the UK called the uh, Transparency Task Force that is doing some really good work in the UK to try and improve the performance of uh, businesses in the financial services area and bringing this sort of information to light. So we've got proven legal situations. Um, we've got proven climate change issues. And more recently, uh, certainly in my book, The Toxic Culture, um, I use, I think, about eight or 10 case studies in there. Um, that really don't get very widely reported, but people have been abused by the companies that they work for. Now, of course, we've become very, um, very aware of this with what's been going on with tr Twitter and Elon Musk recently. But this is not new. Um, I mean, if you if you look at, in fact, it's in the book, um, the toxic culture. It talks about, you know, Elon Musk. If you look at Tesla, for example. They have a set of corporate values that deal with the importance of people and behavior of the organization towards people. At the same time that they're making these public statements, they have been taken to court in California for harassment and uh, discrimination uh, on the, the part of uh, the company to its workforce in that particular area. Uh, there have been many, many cases of, of people being harassed and uh, essentially uh, you know, we talk a lot of di about diversity and inclusion, and people will will produce information. Uh, like, for example, the SEC is now saying that we've got to have more information on on human capital reporting, and so we want companies to to report on diversity and inclusion. What that doesn't tell you, what it does tell you, is how many people they're hiring. What it doesn't tell you 
is how are those people being treated internally? And if we, we sort of look at the stories that are out there, there's an incredible amount of discrimination still going on. Um, one of the book, the uh, stories I tell about in the Toxic Culture book is in the UK. Again, there was a lady who'd been with one of the uh, large financial institutions for many years. And she, not only was she paid uh, about a third less than male counterparts doing exactly the same job that she was doing, she was subject to incredible uh, harassment, discrimination in the work. And, and she got the largest, she took the company to court and she got the largest ever settlement. I think it was two million pounds uh, for the harassment uh, that she was subjected to at work. So, I mean, these things are going on. So we pay a lot of lip service to how important people are in an organization. But the leadership of organizations um, just aren't doing many of the things that they need to do. So what evidence do we have that change is needed? I think we have quite a lot of evidence. And, of course, I've talked about legal, um, doing things illegally. But there are also unethical activities. I mean, one case that was particularly of interest to us here in Canada, um, there was an individual um, who was actually living in Florida at the time, and he was very, fairly famous at the time. Anyway, he was uh, accused of something like 79 charges of, of various uh, frauds and, and various activities. It turned out that so many of the things he was accused of were unethical, but they weren't actually illegal. And so they they ended up, he getting convicted on about five charges, which related to things that they could actually take to court and prosecute him. But you see, corporations can't be prosecuted for acting unethically. They can only be prosecuted for acting illegally. So really, the, the concept of acting ethically is, is a judgment decision that's made by the boards of directors and about the share, by the shareholders and by the, the owners and, and managers of the business, is that is a decision as to how we're going to run this business. So um, I, I think there are many examples of where organizations uh, you know, are, in fact, operating unethically. Um, in my own personal career, this is one was one of my watersheds. As a senior financial officer, I was involved in, in transferring money across between the Canadian and U.S. border in a way that was clearly unethical. It wasn't, it wasn't illegal, but the uh, information that was used to justify it was completely unethical. And in fact, the organization that was in, that I was the senior financial officer for at the time was later taken to court by the tax authorities in Canada um, because the transaction was considered fraudulent. And in fact, there was a there was a settlement. Now, this was like 20 years after I left the company. Um, but where is the line in the sand in in social responsibility? Because, for example, if if we if we make financial transactions like that, move money around the globe, which in some way um, disadvantages people in certain countries. In other words, uh, this is the whole, and I said I would come back to this later, the whole issue of international organizations and international tax planning. Many of us are very concerned about the, uh, the work that the Institute of uh, uh, investigative journalists, you may be familiar, familiar with their work. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Panama Papers, for example, where they've unearthed all sorts of tax shelters um, around the world. And the problem is with so many of these things, there are many, many organizations minimizing the tax they pay. And a lot of people say, oh, that's totally unethical. Well, it's, it may be unethical, but it's not illegal. What business has learned to do is to game the international tax regulations in such a way as to minimize their tax uh, and optimize the returns to their shareholders. Now, I could sit here and say, well, you know, that's unethical and organizations should pay a fair amount of tax. But as soon as you, you take that decision um, and it's not what you're doing is not illegal, 
then your shareholders are going to come after you and say, well, you're paying tax that you don't need to. So we have a real dichotomy. You know, we want organizations to, to act ethically. But in fact, our, our, our tax laws are national tax laws. Now, there is some degree of collaboration and cooperation, but our business, our businesses are working multinationally. So they can arrange things to have transactions take place in certain countries so that they minimize tax in certain countries. That disadvantages the society in those communities where these organizations are extracting significant revenues out of those countries uh, to make their profits, but are not contributing back significant taxes to that economy. And that is not, it, not illegal. It may be unethical, but it's not illegal. So it's a terribly difficult issue um, around responsibility, business responsibility. Um, right. There was a good question here from Anya. Um, yeah, and I, I also wanted to say, yeah, this is uh, this is all very interesting, and clearly there is so much evidence, uh, and you just gone through a few examples, and uh, yeah, and Anya's question, and also I have this question, uh, kind of goes in line with that is, as you mentioned, some of the uh, issues they can be actually punished legally, uh, or at least they they could be an attempt to do that. But some of them are mostly uh, going just on the ethical level. And how can can those uh, be addressed? And uh, so it it becomes more difficult than to even hold the business accountable for for those uh, uh, you know problems or. And then Anya's question is also uh, dealing with uh, that currently not much been done for having businesses held ac accountable. So is the true change possible? That's and really what are, are the barriers to making all this happen? <laughs> yes, I, I, I think there are different barriers for different issues. I mean, I think to come to Anya's question is a really good one. Um, and it's sort of... Uh, been pervasive right from the beginning of the whole question about externalities, because, you know, all of these changes we're talking about in terms of reporting and everything else don't change the reality that organizations in a lot of cases don't directly pay for those things that are externalities. So can we change this? Should they pay for it? Well, I think you would agree that probably there are some cases where organizations do pay for these things. For example, um, things like the Love Canal, um, where organizations were, were proven to have, have created pollution and were taken to court for the remedial action. So, I mean, in some cases, there have been cases where organizations have been held accountable for the cleanup of the, uh, the mess that they left behind. The sad thing is, in many cases, the organizations that caused the problem don't exist anymore. So you can't persecute them because they're not there. Um, I think the greatest leverage is uh, reputation and brand value. And this has been one of the issues that, that I think, uh, certainly if you go back to my book on governance, I made the point that one of the greatest, um, let's call them assets, although they're not financial assets, but one of the greatest things that creates value in many of what they call the fang stocks which is Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, um, anyway, the top technology companies, uh, is their brand value. If you look at the brand value of Apple the last time it was done, I think it was close to a trillion dollars. I mean, it's an incredibly large thing. And it's the, you know, everybody knows they can rely on an Apple product. Everybody knows that the Apple products are going to work together. Everybody knows that Apple's going to stand behind its product. So that is sort of a value that is created in the marketplace by an organization operating and doing a good job that it does. What gets negatively impacted, and, and I believe this is where, you know, Anya's question is good. I think we're beginning to, work, you know, see, uh, we're beginning to move into an environment where employees are making decisions about whether they take their talent to a particular organization based on that organization's environmental performance. So some people, there is evidence out there that, that um, 
people who are making career decisions are making decisions to work for or not work for certain organizations based on their behavior in the marketplace. This also extends to the negative publicity that takes place in, the, in areas like greenwashing. We've seen recently that many organizations or a number of organizations have made public statements about their commitment to the environment, but have then been proven to not be um, uh, abiding by that in the way that they operate. So I think the public at large as a buying community and as uh, individuals with talent seeking employment opportunities are beginning to take these things into account. I think investors are also beginning to take these things into account. We've seen a very large growth in the area of what they call ESG investing. And I, I would take you back a little bit further. There was an uh, an area that started up called social responsibility investing about 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, that deliberately made decisions as to what organizations they would invest in uh, and making decisions either not to invest in certain organizations because of their track record in the environment, um, out of which came something like the carbon disclosure project, where essentially organizations have to now um, are expected to disclose certain information on their their carbon impact. So I think I think it's changing. Long answer to to Anya's question is no. Financially, they're not necessarily being held to account, but I think there's a lot of other things that impact their value in the marketplace, and I think these things are beginning to now being taken in, into account by the public. So I think it will become a reality, and I think that's why governance is so important. Because if you're on the board of directors and you want to protect your shareholders' value, you need to be paying attention to these things. So that, right. in terms of, of that question, so should I jump into, you know, can business change? Is, is this possible? Are we being right. too, too idealistic here? Right. Is, is a, a true change you know, really possible? And yeah. what, what has to happen? And uh, just, uh, yeah, my question was, uh, in some instances, it is possible to hold business accountable, you know, legally. But what if it's more like a in, in internal or uh, ethical ethical uh, issue? How do you hold the business accountable? How can you change that? Yeah, yeah, and that is, I think, the sixty-four thousand dollar question for everybody is, uh, you know, yeah, this is all great, but is everything anything going to really change? Um, I think we're certainly seeing a lot more collaboration internationally where regulatory bodies are beginning to, to pay attention to us. Um, can they change? Well, let, let me talk a little about over, uh, what's over my shoulder here, which is uh, a little bit of the, uh, the framework we use in the, the movement for responsible business, which I should mention that um, I didn't start up, but I am now affiliated with uh, that's based in the UK. A guy called Jim Bignall um, started up this organization. Jim ran his own company. He was CEO of a company in the UK. And when he sold the company, he retired and started up an organization called Responsible Business. Um, so much of it is, is going to be driven. I, I, there are two ways we can make change happen. We can make change happen from the bottom up, and we can make change happen from the top down. And... Of course, the bottom up is to a great degree the regulatory change, which I think we are beginning to see areas. Uh, we, we're in our infancy in, in this area. So will organizations be forced to change by regulation? Yes, they will, but it's not happening fast enough. So it means that we've got to have visionary leadership in organizations that are prepared to go out there and say, we are going to behave this particular way. and. There are pockets of it. You know, there are organizations um, like Paul Polman, who used to be the CEO of, uh, I believe it was uh, Procter & Gamble, if I remember the company right. I think somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. Um, but he certainly, in his time of running the company, ran it on the basis of a responsible business. Um, so I think there are, there are leaders out there who get this, who understand that it's, uh, it's critical to their business. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to perpetuate more leaders recognizing the issue and how they can re reposition their company 
And so if you look at the, the uh, little graphic over my shoulder here, you'll see we have responsible business. So the word responsibility is, is sort of central uh, to what we're trying to do. And by the way, the logo up here of Responsible Business 2030 is that we want to uh, have sustainability and responsible business taught in all uh, schools by 2030 because we think it's the foundation of how we should behave. Um, but the responsible acronym is built on really uh, four pillars. The first pillar, some of you may be familiar with, is purpose. And you can see that one is sort of the P on our responsibility over here. Now, purpose is important because everybody's recognizing that purpose becomes a driving force in a business. So there has to be a clear purpose for a business and it has to understand its purpose. But I would suggest to you that purpose has two parts to it. Every organization is created for a purpose. And so that is the purpose that they were established in the first place. But I would suggest to, to the audience that there is also a social purpose involved in a business because businesses are created in society as a vehicle for economic activity. And if society or as society recognizes businesses as members of society, then there is also uh, an expectation that the purpose of a business would be to act as a responsible citizen in society. And I think we sometimes forget that. We focus so much on what's the business in business to do. And we forget the fact that the business is in, in business to be a responsible citizen as well. Um, Ron, interesting question. Um, companies becoming aware of their environment, social performance, important to best in DHG scores, but invisible how the consulting businesses do not seem to rely on benchmarks. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I, I think part of the difficulty we have in this movement of ESG reporting and moving down towards uh, new metrics to assess organization performance is we have very little in the way of consistency. There is a desire to have more consistent reporting across organizations so some comparability can be done. Um, I would suggest to you that we are making reasonable progress in the area of climate change reporting. Um, there are a number of uh, guidelines that have come out. SASB, as it used to exist in the US and now as part of the, uh, um, the uh, International Accounting Standards Foundation, which used to do all the accounting, or still does all the accounting standards, all of the sustainability standards are now coming under that body. So there is hope that we're going to see some degree of standardization in, in climate change reporting. I think we're much too early to think about standardization in social reporting. Um, I think there are some things, uh, but I think we one of the complexities we have on both um, social and environmental reporting is we, we have different legislation in different countries. So there is a mandatory reporting of certain issues um, uh, both social and environmental in different countries. But again, if you're a multinational corporation, what you have to do is decide, am I going to go for the lowest common denominator and then supplement that with national reporting? Or am I going to take the attitude, I'm going to go for the highest common denominator and report on things I don't need to report on from a statutory point of view, but I'm going to make a decision to report on that so I can be held accountable for it globally. So I, I think we're in sort of very early stage of some of that. So um, to answer your question on the uh, climate change and environmental side, I think we're making some good progress there. And I think we are going to see better benchmarks and capability of doing comparable reporting. I think we're way too early on that socially. And a part of that is because so much of the social side of it is is either not necessarily accepted the same way uh, across different countries um, or there's different legislation um, and it is optional so much of it is optional in this case i mean one of the interesting developments i would suggest that the audience might want to, want to look at this is that um, there's there's sort of a bit of a tug of war going on right now between north america particularly the us and europe 
Um, in the U.S., the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, is coming out with guidelines around the uh, the supplemental reporting of non-financial information. Uh, in addition, the uh, the new sustainability standards, because SASB used to be a U.S.-based organization, and so so much of the uh, the activity of these international sustainability standards that are going to be developed is being influenced by North America. There is uh, an approach in North America that says when we look at what we need to report, and we called it something called materiality, when we look at what we need to report, we look at it from purely an investor point of view. In Europe, the view is that we need what they call double materiality which says, no, you can't just look at what you need to report from an investor point of view. You must look at it from the all stakeholders perspective. So you must look at it from society. You must look at it from the employees. You must look at it from your relationships. So all of the key areas in the business. And that is a very profound difference as to what lens you view corporate performance through. And so the, that's going to be a very interesting development as we move forward. Um, whether the European view of corporations having a much higher level of social responsibility uh, wins out on this, or whether the American view that the investor is predominant and it's all about um, if it's good for the investor, it's good for the economy type of thing. Um, watch this space is what I would say. So how can you be part of the solution? You know, Can business change and can be part of the solution? Uh, I think business has to change and I think it can change. Uh, we run the businesses because that's either legislative, we, what we have to do, or it's what becomes common practice if you want to have a position in the marketplace. So I've talked about purpose. One of the other issues I've touched on already is ethical. And you can see we've got ethical here as well. There has to be a conscious decision in the organization that not only are we are going to talk about being uh, abiding by the law, we're also going to make a conscious decision for doing what's right. We're going to treat people the right way. We're going to be fair to people. We're not going to, for example, like Elon Musk, is just say arbitrarily by email, these people are fired. I mean, number one, that's that's contrary to legislation in, in many countries. Uh, and you can't do that. You can't just do that. Um, but it's it's the wrong way to treat people. Now, Businesses operate in a competitive environment. Do they have to downsize sometimes? Yes, they do. But how you do it and how you actually recognize the impact that it has on the people and their lives and their mental health and all of the, the outcomes that the organization doesn't necessarily pay for, um, that is all about acting ethically. So it's, it's not pretending that business does Nick, uh, I'm sorry. There's been some interruption uh, in the, in the audio. So maybe if you can say it again. Uh, the, the yes. last, yeah, that after after Elon Musk downsizing, uh, you know, Twitter by half. Then yeah, then it it started. Uh, I have to be uh, careful what. I have to be careful what I say on the internet, oh, obviously. That's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, the, the fact is the business operates in an economic reality. And sometimes businesses does have, you know, do have to reduce their costs. It's the way in which you do it that's important, right. not the fact that you have to do it. There is a humane and responsible way to deal with the necessary downsizing where you take into account the impact that it has on the individual and on the community and on the mental health of the individual, which is, let's face it, a cost that society pays for. And so ethical responsibility is behaving in that way. The third area, uh, and we were talking with Anya a little earlier about this, is sustainable. The business not only has to operate in a way that's sustainable from a planetary point of view, in other words, a zero sum. Um, and I find it very interesting if we look at indigenous peoples in many countries, you know, whether it's Australia, the US, Canada, or, or many countries around the world, 
many of those societies understood sustainability. They understood that when you when you come onto this earth, you use the resources of the earth, but you leave the place in as good or better condition as it was when you started. You don't deplete the resources on the planet for future generations. That is irresponsible. And if you look at the question of the definition of what is responsible business, it's acting responsibly and not irresponsibly. Irresponsible business is not caring about these things because you don't have to pay for them. So responsible business operates in a way that is not only sustainable for our society, but is sustainable for um, the resources that it needs to attract and retain inside the business. So I would extend sustainability uh, beyond the traditional approach of climate change. I would extend sustainability to attracting and retaining the human talent, for example, that you need in your organization. If you do what people like Musk do, I would suggest to you that people might choose not to go and work for Twitter because they're going to be working in an environment where they don't know whether they're going to be fired arbitrarily tomorrow. So if I'm a talented individual and I've got a choice of where to go to work, um, I don't think the work climate that's being created in Twitter is sustainable in terms of uh, attracting and retaining human talent. And the fourth area, of course, and this is very important, there is a criticism on sustainability and on responsible business that uh, we're saying the businesses shouldn't make profit. No, the business has to be viable. To be viable, you have to essentially generate a reasonable return for your shareholder. But it's a reasonable return. But it must be viable. I mean, you can't do any of these things if your business is not viable. If you're not making money and you can't pay your interest on your debt and you can't pay dividends to your shareholder, the rest of this stuff really doesn't matter. So it's got to be run on a basis that, yes, we do need to make profit, but we need to make an equitable and reasonable profit. And I would suggest to you, by the way, that one of the problems we have in the marketplace right now is there is there is a lot of profiteering going on on the backs of consumers. Um, certainly in the UK, there's a lot of argument right now. The energy companies are making a lot of money and, in fact, paying this out in dividends to their investors while the average person is seeing their, their cost of energy go up significantly. And that is not fair. That is not ethical. Um, and I, th I think that's part of what brings the behavior of business into disrepute. So that's what a responsible business is. And I think part of, part of the business that's run that way is part of the solution. We have a choice on how we run a business. And the choice is at the shareholder level, at the board of directors level, at the senior management level, we can say, okay, yes, we have a clear purpose on what we want to do in this business, but we also have a clear purpose on the behavior we want to exhibit while we're doing this. So a responsible business runs based on a clear idea of what we're here to do, but they also rest on a clear responsibility and accountability of operating in a responsible way towards the society they operate in. So I, I'm an idealist. I, I do believe we can change. I believe some businesses are playing games. Um, I believe some businesses are continuing to operate in the way that they used to operate. Um, I am hopeful that the generations that are coming up see that there is a better way to do things. And I think we will build a better world, but we really need to get on with it because uh, time is running out, especially on the climate change area. You know, I one of the, the initiatives that we're starting right now is we want to bring people together within organizations to start initiatives around climate change uh, activities. We know, for example, that off COP27, uh, we're running at a level that's not going to get us down to the one and a half percent that we're looking for. Um, yet we know many of the solutions. We look on the other side of the equation um, and there are many statistics. Something was published in Forbes just last month in October saying that 
a large proportion, like 90% of US businesses, management understands that people want to change. They want to see this as being important. So why is it we know there's a problem, we know there's a whole bunch of people that want to do something about it, but we don't seem to be able to bring the two together. And that's the sort of thing that we want to do in the responsible business movement. We want to connect activists who want to do something. They want to see a change. They want to be a change agent uh, with the opportunities that we have to make these things happen in the businesses that we work. So yes. there we go. That's what a responsible business is all about. Uh, yes, yes, I'm a, an idealist. I'm a, a dreamer. But um, I... I believe for the good of society, businesses have a really important role to play. And I believe that they can change and become so much more valuable to business, to the world than they are today. Ron, uh, thanking you for uh, the clear vision of the path towards the, the companies and regulatory, uh, uh, regulatory alignment. And he's also talking about that it would still be good to have a single benchmark uh, guideline, such as uh, the World Bank uh, IFC performance standards to help with the consistency. Uh, yeah, there, if I can add, uh, Vika, there's, there's some, some efforts to try and do some of these things on a holistic basis. For example, there's, a, there's an organization in the UK called the Maturity Institute. And they have developed something that's been around for quite a few years now called OM Index. And OM Index is an assessment scheme that you can do an assessment and come up with a, a score of your business that is a holistic score that is very like the S&P uh, rating, financial ratings. It gives a company a triple A rating or an AA minus or whatever down to a sort of a junk bond status rating. They have actually an assessment scheme right now um, that you can do a self-assessment and you can see where you sit on that continuum. And that then gives you an idea as an integrated entity, you know, how well you are meeting some of these criteria. So we are also beginning to see new metrics coming out to allow us to do this. Um, but I don't think we've we've yet narrowed that down to which are the right metrics. I think we're we're really struggling to figure out what it is we need to measure. Gulsum is saying that uh, they are in agreement with this. Obviously, she's joining us from Almaty, Kazakhstan, and she's also thanking you for uh, your great presentation. And I just also wanted to add uh, that, well, Nick is now, you're an activist inside the organization called Responsible Business 2030. And you can uh, look this up on uh, you know, LinkedIn. There is a website. It's, uh, I understand that it's a new initiative, right? But it has a, a very ambitious goal. And uh, it's just great to, to join become another activist or become one of the, the participants of this initiative. I, uh, I think we need to, to be wrapping up because uh, our time is coming to an end. And I just wanted to also uh, just bring one more time uh, the books, the titles of the books that, that, that Nick wrote and also say that those books are available on, uh, well, on Amazon and on some other uh, uh, on some other bookstores, uh, and if anybody is interested, you can just look them up under under Nick's name, and uh, certainly benefit a lot from you know reading these books, which come from Nick's great experience working across the globe on on various various issues. Thank you so much, Nick. This was really great and it's such an important topic and uh, it would be nice to continue it because obviously now we're just limited by one hour of this broadcast, but I think it's a, it's a huge topic and it can certainly uh, involve a, a lot more uh, yeah. if we want to, to address, it, address it properly. So I will be considering, of course, coming back to it at some point and it will be great to have you again with us as one of the speakers or one of the presenters or the panelists, whatever we come up with as a, as a format. 
So thank you very much. And just a little bit of uh, our uh, announcements. Uh, this will be our last episode in this year. And today is actually our 10th episode. So it's a sort of a small anniversary for us. <laughs> we won't be doing the broadcast on, on January 1st. Uh, because it's a new year and I don't think uh, people will be very much interested in uh, spending time doing other things than, than celebrating. But uh, we definitely will be back on February 1st. And this date is important to us because this is the birthday of Gabriel Al-Salim, uh, who is uh, the inspiration for our activities and our foundation. And uh, uh, traditional on February 1st, we uh, do uh, a conference or at least a more extended event. So this is going to happen this time as well. So please uh, just follow the information on our website and, and our uh, social media. We will be posting more about uh, what it will be like. But definitely remember the date, February 1st, around the same time, which is uh, 1 p.m., or 13 hour GMT time. And uh, we will keep you posted. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, Anya, for running the tech on the background. I'm wishing, uh, and, and thank you for all of the participants who are here asking their questions and supporting us. I got a note that uh, unfortunately the, there were some problems uh, with the, uh, just with, uh, with the video. And I got a note from uh, that the connection was was being not very stable and somebody was losing the connection. Well, please know that all our shows are available for a replay. Uh, after we finish, they will stay on on Facebook, on YouTube. They will also be posted on uh, the website of the Gabriel Asylum Foundation. So you can come back at any time and just just hear it or, or view it and also uh, see what we were you know, talking about today. So I, I apologize again for some of the glitches. Unfortunately, uh, this happens with any, any, any live stream occasionally. Thank you very much. I'm wishing all of you a wonderful holiday season. And we will see you back in the new year 2023 on February 1st. Thank you for staying with us. Goodbye.